what is um, remarkable about the pandemic is that it's impossible at this very moment, when we're still in the midst of the pandemic, it's not over yet, to tell, to respond to the question who is going to be, uh, who is going to be doing best in terms of uh, tackling the future. Today, we can disentangle the reasons that have led some countries to perform better than others. Um, and in fact, every single forecast that was made at the beginning of the pandemic, most of them has been proven wrong. You may remember that we, we said that the discount would be much higher in emerging markets, in Africa in particular, it hasn't happened. We said at the beginning, we being the consensus, that um, the most advanced economies would be best equipped to deal with COVID-19, which has proven to be untrue, and in fact it was the opposite. The US and the UK, which are one, two of the most performing economies in the world, have been doing very badly until recently and then doing very well in terms of vaccination. So it's impossible to draw any particular lesson in terms of uh, who's been doing really well um, in terms of um, dealing with the pandemic. Now, regarding the future, um, in the book, we posit that um, there are two, two roads. We are to crossroad, and either you take the road which leads to a brighter future in which you address the two key issues, which are inequalities, economic and social inequalities, and green investment, you know, dealing with the environment and climate change and, uh, and these um, re regular occurrence of extreme weather events triggered by climate change. So the countries which we think are going to do best in the future are those who would embrace um, wholeheartedly these two principles therefore deciding to go green and deciding to do everything they can to reduce inequalities. And on that front, a region, not a country, but a region which I think is doing pretty well and is probably ahead of everybody else, even though it's not recognized, is Europe, the EU. You know, the EU is doing well, um, even though we have the impression at the moment that it's very tough because of the current third wave of the pandemic. But when you look at green investment, um, the EU is currently ahead of every single other region, every other region in the world. Um, the US is catching up fast, but the EU is ahead. And in the EU, EU there have been policies um, implemented to alleviate this problem of social inequality. So, in my view, a region which is well positioned to do best or better in the future is the European Union. Well, we, we, we've had a chance to organize um, with our um, community uh, a webinar with the French, uh, with, with, the, with the Spanish Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. And, um, and it's important, it makes you realize that every single situation within the EU is of course unique. And the situation of, um, of Spain was made um, initially more difficult by the fact that Spain is very reliant on, um, on tourism revenues. Um, a large chunk of um, Spanish GDP uh, depends upon um, tourism revenues from Europe and from the rest of the world. And at the moment, travel and tourism is industry that's been hit the hardest by the pandemic, um, which, um, which is a situation that uh, is likely to endure. We don't know when the situation regarding travel and tourism will go back to normal. Uh, maybe it will never go back to normal, it will be fundamentally different. Um, so Spain, in that respect, particularly the regions of Spain that are so critically dependent on tourism, have been hit very hard. Now, um, you know, Spain is a very diversified economy, uh, it's a very innovative economy uh, in many respects, and um, what the pandemic has shown is that um, countries need to put into place um, strategies that tend to diversify the economies, uh, not to make them too over-reliant on um, the service sector like travel and tourism, for example, and also innovate. Um, you know, what the pandemic has made absolutely clear to everybody is a critical need to innovate from a technological point of view. Um, and this is true for every single industry. Um, it's true for travel and tourism, it's true for pharma, it's true for media, it's true for manufacturing. And uh, if there is one lesson to be drawn from what the pandemic has taught us so far, 
it is the critical need to innovate as far and as fast as possible. Well, I think the key element is digital. Um, the pandemic has tremendously accelerated the pace of digital innovation and uh, it has made every single industry, every single company aware of the fact that if you are not um, at the cutting edge in terms of digital, digital application, digital innovations, you are bound to be in, into trouble. Um, you know, the pandemic has uh, accelerated digital to an extent that would have been inconceivable, unthinkable just a few, few months before COVID started. Um, telemedicine, for example, uh, everybody was talking about telemedicine in 10, 20 years from now. It's happening. Um, delivery, uh, delivery through drones, through automated vehicles, it's going to happen very fast. Um, in the event space, which is, you know, a Spain a space which had very little innovation, very little productivity um, for, for many years, you realize now that um, they need to be hybrid and rely on digital capabilities. So uh, the big lesson, you know, which is obvious, but that nobody, not all of, not all companies have taken um, into account yet, is the critical uh, need to invest into digital capabilities, because if you don't, you are bound to be in big, big trouble. It's true for banks, it's true for manufacturing, it's true for events industry, it's true for every single industry you may want to consider. Well, in the book, um, we wrote the book about a year ago, and um, by interviewing um, you know, CEOs of very large companies, it seemed obvious to us that um, working from home would become a permanent feature of the world economy because you know the largest banks the largest tech companies um, at that time a year ago said you know, it's now proven that you can be highly effective and productive even more productive while working from home than um, working in an office and of course this only applies to um, uh, white collar workers uh, but it's a substantial chunk of the of the global economy and global economic activity um, so this is going to be a feature of uh, tomorrow's economies. Another point that is, I think, very, very important, um, even though it's harder to grasp it, is the um, increase in um, uh, interest for well-being and wellness. Um, you know, the, the, uh, paradoxically, the pandemic has made us aware that um, nature um, is absolutely vital. You know, nature, being in nature, is vital for our mental well-being, for our physical well-being, and uh, the appetite for, for nature has has grown enormously during the pandemic. Um, uh, so has the appetite for wellness. So I think an important lesson to be drawn from these uh, times of confinement and uh, having to live with COVID is the um, increasing relevance of our mental wellness and our physical wellness. Hence, the critical importance of finding the right work-life um, balance. Um, and it's not something that can be easily um, understood yet, but there are many surveys that point to this um, fundamental re reprisal of the way in which we, we, we lead our lives. For example, working from home, it's good for us because, uh, because we don't have to commute and commuting to the office and back from the office is a is a well-being destroyer. You know, it's it's awful to spend hours and hours in the public transport or in the car. It is awful. So there are many such considerations that will come to the fore when the pandemic is over, and that will um, we think in the book um, um, lead to complete new ways of of working uh, in new collaborative ways. Um, finding new social connections, working maybe more with um, different companies in, uh, in, in, in platforms that mix people from diverse groups and companies, finding a better equilibrium between work and life balance, etc. I think these are given as a pandemic. You know, education, I've been, uh, when writing the book and uh, after we wrote the book um, over the past few months, I've had many discussions with um, 
deans of universities or business schools, uh, with students, of course. And uh, um, there is a very clear understanding that, um, like for work, there is going to be a completely new way of uh, being educated. Um, uh, and hybrid education is probably here to stay, you know, a mix of uh, um, physical courses um, and, uh, and online courses. Um, so education is going to be completely reinvented. Um, one of the uh, insights which I think is interesting and is not being discussed very broadly yet is the interest for experiential learning. Uh, so you learn more about what you need to know to exercise your profession, to do your work, by experiencing things um, and sometimes not in a not in a not in a room, not in a very fixed course. Um, you can do so by being outside, by, by working uh, with um, um, different people, by uh, trying different bits and pieces, different things, by um, studying for micro diploma instead of going for a four year course where you learn everything about marketing. For example, you may do mini courses, uh, mini mini courses about uh, neuroscience, uh, uh, marketing, selling psychology um, um, I was talking about nature a few minutes ago you can learn a lot by going into nature and uh, uh, I was struck to realize that there are many new schools being built all around the world that are completely changing the way of educating people they tell you that instead of being in a class uh, seated on a chair as we are at the moment you go into nature and you learn about biology history geography mathematics, uh, poetry, by being outside, by talking to trees, by looking at animals, by exchanging with your peers um, around um, a stream. Uh, so there are many new ways of being educated and um, I think we're just at the beginning of a very profound uh, mutation and disruption of education. Well, again, something that has been much talked about over the past month um, particularly in the fight, in, the, in, the, in light of the fact that um, um, COVID-19 is going to trigger a gigantic wave of mental illness that may last for an entire generation, particularly for the younger generation. Um, there is a lot of evidence that um, the uh, incidence of mental illness is increasing dramatically all around the world, you know, for obvious reasons. We are social animals, so, you know, leading in isolation or being connecting all the time to a, a Zoom call is not a proper way to 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 have a fulfilling life. As we all know, we are all Zoomed out. Um, uh, so there have been many, many studies uh, conducted uh, by psychologists, by neuroscientists, by psychiatrists, etc., on how best to deal with the situation. And um, one of them, you know, which um, I've been applying in my own life for years and years, is again to go outside, to go in nature. And there have been such strong evidence that being outside is a fantastic cure um, when you can afford to do so, of course. Uh, you know, but you know, when you can be next to nature, to greenery, um, it's good for you. Um, if you can spend uh, you know, one or two hours outside, it's the best possible cure um, in terms of light mental illnesses. And uh, today, uh, it's interesting to observe that there are many countries in which um, doctors are prescribing uh, walks in nature, for example, to treat um, the um, early forms of depression. Um, so being outside um, is, is probably a very powerful antidote to mental illness and then you know, there is the uh, usual long list of things that we ought to, to do in terms of uh, social connections, in terms of uh, not being too overworked, in terms of having uh, normal conversations with, uh, with our families, with our friends, with our neighbours. But the importance of weak ties as well, you know, connections with people who are not uh, part of our inner circle but uh, who are critically important in terms of our own well-being. You know, talking to the people who sell you products, uh, pe talking to, to people in the street, all of these play a very critical role. So I would say social connections and nature.